Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hope that everybody is okay. And uh, thank God uh, I got my voice back a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Coming in uh, January, I lost totally my voice back home. But I'm thankful to God that uh, I'm able to speak my thoughts to you this morning. Happy New Year. I wanted to say that. <laughs> Happy New Year to everybody and thank you, the Lord, for I am back. Thank God for a wonderful New Year, fruitful New Year. And uh, this morning we're going to talk about welcoming 2024, a wealth of resolution. Now, which wealth I prioritize? So, resolution. It says a, uh, a firm decision to do or not to do something. Every year or every beginning or ending of the year, many people have this what we call New Year's resolution. And again, it is a firm decision to do or not to do something. Now, if you would look at the survey in Statista, the survey tells us that uh, most common New Year's resolution among U.S. respondents who have made one or several, number one comes is to save more money. The next one would be to exercise more. Now, in other survey in Forbes Health um, survey, it says improve fitness. And then the other one is improved finances. Now, I want you to look very carefully at those two. Okay. And this one, all right. Now, the less popular resolutions include traveling more, meditating, drinking, and performing better at work. Now, on average, there are only 5% of people succeed with their New Year's resolution, according to enterpriseappstoday.com. 5%. That will be uh, those who succeed in their New Year's resolution. Now, physical well-being is the number one in the list. Amongst the top New Year's resolution every year, number one and number two would be physical health and financial health. Okay, now, what do these surveys tell us? If we're going to go back to our scripture reading in Matthew chapter 6, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us not to store up treasures here on earth, but stores up treasures in heaven. Now, the question, what those surveys tell us? Well, number one, it tells us the less importance of God to men. If you would notice again those two surveys, none of those mentioned about getting closer to God. Have you noticed? None of those. So it tells us that we are less uh, keen, leaning towards, less leaning towards God. So less importance of God to men. And secondly, it tells us we are more concerned of the short term rather than the long term. We are more concerned of our life today rather than our life in the afterlife. And number three, it tells me that there's a great challenge for me, a great challenge for you and I to make known the importance of God. Because none of those survey tells us that we need to be closer to God. So it's a challenge for you and I as Christians, as believers of God, to go out there and make known the importance of God. Why? Why? Because if there's no judgment of hell in the afterlife, then there's no need for the Savior. Right? If there's no hell, then why do I need my Savior? 
John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish. It means, therefore, my dear brethren and friends, that there is life after this life. That there is hell that comes to those who will not accept the Lord. Because the Lord said that whoever believes in Him should not perish. So therefore, there is what we call those that will perish. But then again, the other side of it, they would, those who believe in God would have everlasting life. So this morning, my dear brethren and friends, we will discuss about the five types of wealth. Physical or health wealth, <clears throat> financial wealth, <clears throat> social wealth, time wealth, and spiritual wealth. The question now again is, what is important to our lives? Now, physical health. Third John chapter 1, verse 2, Dear friends, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. Physical health, this includes mental health. People argue that health wealth is of utmost importance because enjoying life demands great health. Right? Even how wealthy financially you are, a person is, if he is sickly, then he won't enjoy his labor. He won't enjoy his financial wealth, right? It will just go to his medical bills. And he will not enjoy a quality time with his family and friends if his health is getting in the way. I heard Brother Carlos mentioned about you know, taking care of our health, listening to our wife. You know, it pays to listen to our wife. <laughs> when I was back home, my wife told me to rest my voice. I did not listen. <laughs> so, gentlemen, it pays to listen to our wife. <laughs> now, um, in, in later years, in later years of our life, or in later years of our life, you know, if we are, if we don't have this good help, we will not enjoy the fruits of our labors. And then we will not enjoy our grandkids. <laughs> we will not enjoy them, right? Uh, you know, our health will rob us of that wonderful privilege in the process. And there are reasons why many people nowadays are into serious health programs. Many people are going to the gym. Many people are uh, going into healthy eating. If we neglect to take care of our health today, it will only lead to a greater health problems later on in our life. Now, I was privileged enough to meet a brother of ours at uh, the Golden Gate Church of Christ. Uh, his name is Brother Art Madlaing. Uh, he is a columnist <clears throat> at, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> at Philippines uh, News Today. Uh, circulating here in the Bay Area. And he is also an author of different books and a publisher. He also founded the uh, Fitness for Humanity. And at one point, I read in an article, uh, then uh, First, Lady, First Lady Michelle uh, Obama wrote him and thanked him for his contribution you know, to lessen children's uh, uh, obesity and uh, advocating health. Okay. So, as Christians, it's a must for all of us uh, to advocate help, uh, to encourage one another to pursue healthy lifestyle. I remember having this conversation with the brother in Christ back home. Uh, we were talking about evangelism ministry, how we would go out, even in our old age, how we would evangelize, how, would, how we would still I continue sharing the gospel. And then we came to a point in our conversation, in our discussion about taking care of ourselves. You know, if part of the evangelistic plan is to serve the Lord even in our old age, and then we ask this question, 
How can we still serve God in our old age if we will not take care of our health today? So we were kind of caught up in that question because, you know, we're young, we have this vibrancy, we have this health, as if we don't care what will happen tomorrow, as if we will not grow old, as if we will not lose our vigor, vigor, our strength. But then again, in our discussion, we ask this question. Now, the Bible has this principle that we can apply even in our health. It says, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Now, we can apply this particular uh, passage from the Bible as part of our preventive healthy habits, you know, regular exercise, drinking plenty of water, eating properly. I never knew the importance of drinking plenty of water. I learned from, from when I entered school that we should drink eight glasses of water a day. But I never put that to heart. The only time I put that to heart when I got kidney stones. Then I learned the importance of drinking plenty of water. You know, sometimes we let those things pass by, goes by our senses, and then we will soon realize when we are totally sick, the importance of those things. So drink plenty of water, eat properly, exercise, have enough sleep. It is by taking care, in, taking care of ourselves our mind, our body, and our emotions that we can fully serve God even in our old age. So take care of your health and uh, your health will take care of, your, of you tomorrow. Okay? So take care of your health today and your health will take care of you tomorrow. The next health or wealth <clears throat> is financial wealth. Many people want to talk about this. Many people. Ecclesiastes 5, 19, furthermore, God has given riches and wealth to every man, and he has enabled him to enjoy them, to accept his lot, and to rejoice his labor. This is a gift from God. Financial wealth. In the most common term, most people call it financial freedom. Capable of buying whatever you want capable of purchasing whatever your heart's desire. Pursuing financial freedom, it is not bad at all. It's a blessing from God. Now, money is not bad. Again, it's a gift from God. Acquire it decently. You know, go after it in a decent way, not contrary to God. Uh, it is for you and I to enjoy as a fruit of our labor. Now, in financial wealth, it is not how much assets that you have, like money, properties, receivables, you know, all combined. It is not those all assets combined that makes a person wealthy. It is your net worth. It is your net equity. Now, for example, you know, just to give an example, it's net equities, total assets, less your total liabilities. For example, if you have 1 million cash, house, cars, yacht combined, you have 100 million, less your liabilities, your payables of 90 million, then you have a 10 million net worth. Does it mean that you have 1 million net worth? No, you only have 10 million net worth. Now, if the other way around, you have 9 million in assets, less 100 million in payables and liability, then you have a negative net worth of 10 million. You don't have actually a net worth, but you are actually in debt. Okay? Sometimes people look often wealthy because of the things they have. Luxurious house, cars, lifestyles, clothes, etc. And sometimes we envy them. We look at them and we envy them. Wow, they're so wealthy. But oftentimes, they just look wealthy on the surface. But underneath, 
if you know their net worth, you might be surprised that you are wealthier than them, right? So, because they have so much debt, they have so much liabilities than you are. So the basic secret to living and building wealth and staying financially healthy is what they say, live within your means. No, it is not to live within your means. To build your wealth and to have financial freedom, as they say, it's not to live within your means, but to live beyond your means. Because living, for example, if you're earning 4,000 a month, if your 4,000 a month is your means, then if you are spending 4,000 a month, then you are living within your means. So if you are, if you are spending 4,000, you are not saving. So you are not building anything. So you are living within your means. But if you are spending only 2,500 a month, then you have an excess of 1,500 a month. Then you are building your wealth. Then you are living below your means. So if you want to be financially wealthy, to have savings, live not within your means, but live below your means. And another thing, important thing about in the aspects of financial wealth is what they call budgeting. You have to budget all your expenses. Okay. So that is financial wealth. Now social wealth, the third wealth is social wealth. The Lord God said it is not good for the man to be alone I will make a suitable helper for him. Social wealth is the total value of the resources that you have to meet your social or emotional needs. Social connections is the currency of social wealth. A social connection can be defined as a person that you have the potential to interact with, whether it is face-to-face, -face, on the phone, in the internet, etc., via mail, etc. So that is social wealth now social wealth this include your family your friends your relatives your co-workers okay, just like in economic wealth you inherit some of the social wealth your family okay, your, your relatives you are born with it and others you earn like in financial wealth you earn some of this also in social wealth you earn some of those friends for example, you are not born with friends. You earn friendship. Now, each connection also has a different value depending on how deep it is. Now, social wealth is used to fulfill our emotional necessities, such as security. We need social wealth. We need relationship. We need bonding because we need to belong. Security belongingness and connectedness you know being a part of a larger group through social connections it allows us to feel alive it allows us to feel special and some of our biological system have evolved to make us maintain a social connectedness now the satisfaction of this biological, what they call biological system, gives us a sense of emotional well-being. So when you talk about social wealth, it talks about real relationship. And you and I, we need relationship. We need to feel love, to love and to be loved. As they say that humans are a social being. Now there is our need to be connected to one another. Man is not meant to be alone, as we have read in Genesis. God knew from the beginning that man should not be alone. That's why he created somebody to be with Adam. He created relationship. He created family. God knew the importance of relationship. Though a person can survive alone, real happiness can only be achieved through relationship. So that is uh, social wealth.
Now, the largest, they say, the largest determining factor for your happiness is the quality of your relationships. The stronger they are, the more connected you feel, and the happier you're going to be. Social wealth. Now, the fourth wealth, what they call time wealth. Ephesians 5 tells us, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So what is time wealth? Time wealth is the amount of time you have that you can spend on what deemed valuable to you. Okay? It is your ability. Ability to what? It talks about, when you talk of time wealth, it talks about control. Your ability to control the time, your time, where you want to spend your time with. So when we talk of time wealth, we talk about control. The freedom to control your life, the freedom to control your time, to drive it where you want it to go, where you want it to spend. That is time freedom. That is time wealth. You know, many are financially wealthy, but are not time wealthy. See, it does not mean that if you are wealthy financially, you are time wealthy as well. No, because there are so there are those who are financially wealthy. They are so busy pursuing money to the point of not enjoying money anymore because they are so busy. Oftentimes, they miss much time in the family because they are so busy catching up wealth. That's why many people in the past decades have advocated, you know, in what they call passive income. I know probably you've heard the term passive income. Many have developed a way to earn a passive income. Passive income is money working for you. Okay, you are making money if you're if even you're sleeping. For example, uh, if you have properties, you are renting it out. You have monthly income. Okay? Even if you're not doing anything, you are creating, you are making an income out of those rentals. Real estate. And this has been booming for the past many years. Content creator. YouTube. Many people are creating so much money. And those are passive income. Even when they are sleeping, they are, cre they are making income because of views, because of clicks. And those are passive income. You know, and I, re I remember when I first saw, I don't know if you know, Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast. <laughs> the first time I saw him in YouTube, I don't know him. And then when I searched and I found out that he is the top earner in YouTube, the number one. He has a net worth of 500 million dollars. <laughs> wow. And he's just like 22 years old. He started young, 13, 12. He has a net worth of 500 million. See? Now, having a passive income, you are now spending less of your time in the office because of the passive businesses that you have. If you are earning more because of this passive income, you have now more time in your hand. Okay? You have now more time to spend with your family, and that is time wealth. Again, it does not follow if you are wealthy financially, you are wealthy also in time. No. So time wealth. And finally, spiritual wealth. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Spiritual wealth is the abundance 
the abundance of Christ's likeness in us as we live our lives daily, leading us to eternity in heaven. And that is spiritual wealth. Now, how do you accumulate? How can you have spiritual wealth? Colossians chapter 3, 5 to 10 tells us that we must put to death what is therefore earthly to you. You have put to death those that are making you sinful in order for you to be spiritually wealthy. And when you do that, verse 10 tells us, when you put to death that is earthly to you, you have to put on a new self. You see, as I often say, that repentance is 180 degree turn and walking towards God. You see, people tell us that repentance is 180 degree turn. Yes, if you turn your back from the devil and then say, you are now facing God, but what are you doing? You are not drawing closer to God. You must draw closer to God. When you repent, not only you are turning your back from the devil, but you must draw closer to God. That's what Colossians chapter 3 is telling us. You put to death. You put to death what is earthly to you. And then you do what? Do you, do you stop there? No, you don't stop there. You put on a new self. And how do you put on a new self? It tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17, that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Therefore, you subject yourself to Christ. And by doing so, you become a new person because the old life is gone and a new life has begun. And also it tells us that we must renew, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Not only... We put off our old self, we put on Christ, but we do it as we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We continue to learn, we continue to seek, we continue to be more and more like Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Now, with all those said about the five um, typical types of wealth, pursuing wealth one to four, pursuing wealth one to four is not at all bad. If you pursue financial wealth, time wealth, social wealth, and the other one, <laughs> it's not at all bad. Not at all bad. The problem will come if we will live out number five, that's where your problem will come. If you will live spiritual wealth, it is common knowledge that there's God. Every one of us here, even those who have not yet accepted the Lord, they believe that there is God. And some even might prefer to call them a higher being, something higher than you and I, something spiritual. Okay? Now, if you look carefully, again, at the five types of wealth, only spiritual wealth will answer the problem of man's eternal damnation in hell. That will only answer this problem. Okay? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been made, has not been raised. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. At the start of our lesson, I mentioned that many people only see the life here on earth. You see, but Paul said, if our hope in Christ is only, only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Because what we hope for is not only in this life, my dear brethren and friends, what we hope for is also in the afterlife. That's why we strive so hard to be Christ-like day in and day out.
Now, among those wealth, prioritizing spiritual wealth, putting God first into our life, will give you the other wealth. It will give you the other wealth. Trust me. Now, look carefully at this verse in Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It says, first, seek first. Prioritize. Prioritize God above anything else. Don't prioritize financial wealth. Don't prioritize social wealth. Prioritize spiritual wealth. God said, Jesus Christ said, and then he said, these things, things that are necessary for life. And we know as Christians, even though those that are not Christians, they know that God created everything, Hebrews 11.3. God created everything. Whatever you and I have belongs to God. God created it. God created time wealth. Genesis 1.1 tells us in the beginning, God created time wealth. God created social wealth. Genesis 2.18 is not good for man to be alone. God will make a suitable helper for you and I. God created social wealth. God created health wealth, mental wellness. 2 Peter 1.3, Philippians 4.7. It tells us God will give you all those things. Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus. All of those things, if you pursue spiritual wealth, God will give all of those things. Here is a warning. Deuteronomy 8, 17, 18. You might say in your heart, the power and strength of my hands have made this wealth for me. But remember that it is the Lord, your God, who gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers even to this day. Remember, it is not you, but it is God who make it possible. Remember that. Now, as the new year unfolds before us, my dear brethren and friends, be careful how you prioritize your life. Don't make the same mistake that you did yesterday, last year, or years ago. Don't make the same mistake. Be very careful in pursuing financial health, financial wealth, health wealth, social wealth, and time wealth. Because you might not be aware of it, it is robbing you of the most important wealth there is, spiritual wealth. When we are so caught up, when we are so focused, amassing ourselves with those four wealths, we are uh, robbing ourselves of spiritual wealth. You know, while our choices Help, helps us to have the best in this world, financial stability, time freedom, great health, and strong social connections. You know, be careful because the lure, the lure of this wealth, this four wealth, is what Satan uses to keep us from choosing and pursuing the greatest wealth of all, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. Remember who gave you the job of yours. Remember who gave you that job that you long for. Remember who gave you that car that you dream of. Remember who gave you that wonderful relationship with your family and friends. Remember whom you called and prayed to when you are sick, when your loved ones are sick. Remember, it is all God. It is all God. Let us not forget about it. Now, it's, if somehow we are forgetting this, let me leave all of us this final thought. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord sends poverty 
and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. All we need is a humble heart in the sight of God. Let us all pursue spiritual wealth. Now the only wealth that will stand on the judgment day will be your spiritual network. And that is Jesus Christ that you have, that you kept from the moment you accepted him until you breathed your last. Now I appeal to those who have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, just like I appeal to these people. I have appealed to these people. Now I believe in some areas of wealth, you have more than them. I believe that. I believe that we have more financial than them, social connections than them, time wealth than them, health wealth than them. But when they hit the call to have Jesus Christ in their lives, now I believe they have more to rejoice than some of us here. Because they have now spiritual wealth, the greatest wealth of all. So why not come now and take that step towards the greatest wealth of all. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? <laughs>